welcome back. It is still the run-up. And uh, in 2020, the country enjoyed a trade surplus of about 4.6 billion US dollars from the continent. And Africa takes up a 20% share of Nigeria's exports. Economic links between Nigeria and the rest of the continent uh, should grow under the African continental free trade area. And as the country charts a partway from its dependence on all exports, the planned review of Nigeria's foreign policy must be evidence-driven. Uh, uh, to benefit the country and its citizens, the interests of both should first be clearly defined. And while Nigeria does need to rethink its approach to engaging the wider world, it shouldn't lose sight of Africa's continued relevance in its affairs. Uh, let me ask this uh, uh, question. Uh, well, before I get to the question, uh, we have uh, Debayo Oluwake. He's a principal research fellow, African Resource Development Center, and he's still here. Uh, we had him yesterday, mm -hmm. even though I wasn't here. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we're starting off this way. Nigeria's first point of entry into the African diplomatic space. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of conversation around that. I mean, even in primary school, they will tell you that uh, Nigeria is like the big brother mm -hmm. of Africa, and of course, West Africa, if you want to bring it closer. And that's because you know our uh, diplomatic ties go beyond the shores of the country, of course, and you know a lot of conversations around that. But now a, a new government is coming in, and there's not been a lot of talk about this diplomatic space and how Nigeria has been. You know, uh, it's more like we've stepped a few steps backwards. So, uh, so how, or, or too much into the future of what we do not even understand. You know, because you know it, it, it gets all muddled up in a lot of things, more like we're biting more than we can mm -hmm. chew, or we're living in past glory, but whichever uh, situation it is, we're looking at 2023, we're already in it, uh, the elections are coming up in barely a month, and how do you think the upcoming government will best step into the diplomatic space for Nigeria? Mr. Bayer. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think, first of all, that the, the role of Nigeria um, as, if you like, the big brother, people like to say that, uh, on the continent, some have suggested that this role uh, is divine. You know, that is, it's something that Nigeria had no choice but to grow into. Okay? And if you look at the trajectory uh, of our foreign policy evolution, you may want to agree with that. For example, um, the first point of entry that we made definitively into the African diplomatic space was actually at the origin of the formation of the Organization of African Unity, the OAU, which today is known as the African Union. And you had two regional blocks at the time. You had what was called the Casablanca block. Of course, Casablanca is in Morocco. And then you had the Monrovia block. And Monrovia is the capital of um, Liberia, named after President Monroe. Now, Nigeria belonged to the Monrovia block. And Nigeria was one of the countries which championed the merger of these two blocks, the Casablanca block and the Monrovia block. Uh, and that was successfully achieved. And it led to the formation of the Organization of African Unity. So you can argue that. Um, right from her independence, Nigeria already found herself having to lead, to play a role uh, in, in, in trying to ensure that the best on the continent of Africa was harnessed for the benefit of our people. Of course, at that time, the priority was the liberation of the rest of Africa, because by 1960, just a few African countries had become independent. So, and those few, Ghana became independent, as you know, uh, the first was the first sub Saharan African country to become independent. And so, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana was playing a very big role, mobilizing and galvanizing the others. And so, Nigeria found herself um, also joining the fray and actively engaging to make sure that the Casablanca and Monrovia blocks joined together to form the African Union, the Organization of African Unity, now known as the AU. So I think that was our first definitive entry point into the African diplomatic space. 
journey been so far? Because we entered at that time and we played a significant role. We got the name Big Brother, as we have all said. But it seems as if uh, the focus has been lost uh, somehow. Okay, let me take, for instance, um, uh, the, the, the road and the rail to, to Niger Republic. Yeah. Yesterday we were talking about how the people were made to own the foreign policy, how the people, even to primary school level, donated money, $400 million, you said yeah, yesterday? 400, 400 million naira. Naira, which was more than $400 million dollars anyway. Was 63 cover, yeah. Yes. So n now, when that, whatever was done to Niger Republic, for instance, buying cars for them and doing uh, a road or a rail to Niger, that's, I'm sure, it's part of the foreign policy. But the people didn't seem to know what it was. The people didn't seem to understand because it seemed as if it's something that just came off the cuff of someone and it was not something that the entire nation was carried along. So did we meet, miss the part somewhere? Did we, are we now not as deliberate with our foreign policy as we used to be? How would you rate uh, the foreign policy direction nowadays as compared to what we used to have? Well, um, just, just quickly before I, I answer the question, you see, the, the Nigerian government has always supported neighboring countries. So you, you know we discussed this extensively yesterday. Yes. We looked at how Francophone countries did not listen to France when France wanted them to support Biafra. Because many African countries have different ethnic groups. All African countries are multi-ethnic. Well, 90% or more are, are multi-ethnic. So if you're a multi-ethnic state and you support the breakup of another multi-ethnic state, you're basically saying you're encouraging the breakup of your own country. Yeah. So that didn't resonate with the rest, with, with the Francophone states. And so they, they, they remained loyal to the idea of one Nigeria. And Nigeria repaid that. That actually was the at the core of the foundation of ECOWAS. But now, um, from the military era, oh, sorry, from the First Republic, when we had Prime Minister Tafar Balewa, you know, uh, Nigeria deployed, surprising, this would be surprising for many people, Nigeria deployed its first external military operation was in what was called Tangayika, which was Tanzania and Zanzibar. The two countries came together to form Tanzania. But at that time, it was Tangayika. You have Tangayika, and you had Zanzibar. And the, in, in Tangayika, the army rebelled against the government. And there was a, the army mutinied against the government. And Nigeria sent troops. I think this was in 1963. Nigeria sent troops immediately to Tangayika. You know, people don't talk about that when they talk about Nigeria's foreign policy. But that was a very, very bold move at that time. And then later on, Nigeria sent troops into Congo, Congo Kinshasa, which later became known as uh, Zaire, and today is known as the Democratic Republic of Congo. And those were the origins of what you may call an activist foreign policy. But coming back to, you know, whether this same foreign activist foreign policy has remained, I would say that from 1960, when Nigeria became independent, up until 1989, when we had Perestroika and Glasnost as policies of uh, former President Mikhail Gorbachev of the Soviet, the last president of the Soviet Union, um, the foreign policy direction of Nigeria was assured, was definitive. The trajectory was well known. But when President Gorbachev launched Perestroika and Glasnost to reform the old Soviet Union, this had significant impact on international relations. And it affected the foreign policies of so many countries. Because don't forget that we were clamoring for the liberation of African states. And the Soviet Union played a big role in that. Cuba played a big role in that. And on the other hand, you have the Euro-Atlantic powers who were opposed, as it were, to the liberation of those, especially the Southern African states. So there was a clash. And that was the core of our foreign policy, to ensure that the black person, wherever he was found, or wherever she was found, was, you know, had dignity, was well respected, and so on and so forth. 
So Gorbachev's policies impacted the entire foreign policy direction of so many countries, and Nigeria was not an exception. And I feel that that was where we started having, uh, if you like, uh, a reduction in the tempo uh, and direction of our foreign policy, you know. But nonetheless, I am good. Like you and I were saying, discussing yesterday, we have the emergence, a return to, to democratic rule in 1999 in Nigeria, and the succession by uh, President Abu Mbeki of the Mandela presidency saw a very interesting uh, bilateral, uh, if you like, uh, agreement, so to speak, between Nigeria and South Africa that led to the rejuvenation of the African Union through the new partnership for Africa's development and the transformation that it brought. Within those eight interesting years, you know, when these two gentlemen uh, were in power. And that showed us what South Africa and Nigeria can do in lifting up the African continent. So I would say that our, our activist foreign policy uh, was continuous, was definitive. Um, and you see, as part of that, uh, don't forget that the origin or the, or the, the high point of that foreign policy, that activist foreign policy, was the emergence, was, was, was during the emergence of uh, General Murtala Ramat Mohammed uh, in 1975, when we had the stalemate in Angola. The liberation, the Portuguese colonies in Africa, imagined were still under colonial rule in the 70s when the rest of the continent was free. The Portuguese refused to leave. And so in Angola, you had the MPLA, the FNLA, and the UNITA, three liberation movements fighting against the Portuguese. And when the Portuguese ran away with, without putting anybody in charge, these three liberation movements started fighting against each other. And the FNLA and UNITA were supported by the United States and Western Europe. And when Muritala Mohammed became uh, head of state, the first meeting he would attend in Addis Ababa, he read a speech titled, Africa has come of age. And that speech that he read, he told, he point, in, in a point blank way, so to speak, he told all the African heads of state in the room, he said, you are either for the liberation of Angola or you are against it. And if you are for the liberation of Angola, you must support the MPLA, okay? And if, if you are supporting UNITA or, 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 or FNLA, it means that you are on the side of those who are against Africa's interests. That was a defining moment for the Organization of African Unity, was a defining moment for Angola, it was a defining moment for Nigerian foreign policy, and it made the United States to take note because the MPLA went ahead to win, to become, to form the government of Angola. And for the first time in the history of Africa, a sitting American president, President Jimmy Carter, visited Nigeria for four days. That was a, an acceptance of the emergence of Nigeria, or what Professor Bola GME calls as part of the concept of medium powers. So Nigeria's foreign policy has, it was consistent, because if you look at what Tafar Balewa did as prime minister, sending troops to Tanganyika, sending troops to the Democratic Republic of Congo, although as part of the UN. And if you look at, you know, that trajectory just continued until the, the, the even under General Gowon. It's just that we were at war, and so General Gowon's government couldn't really continue, you know, in that definitive way. Because we, for four years, we were three years, we were basically fighting. And then for two years after that, we're trying to repair the damage and try to bounce back. But it, shortly after General Gowon's uh, ouster, we saw that Nigeria continued that trajectory. And a second high point, because the liberation of the Southern African countries was what you might call through kinetic and soft power application. The, the, the nationalization of British petroleum in Nigeria by General Obasanjo, when the British government refused to take responsibility for midwifing black majority rule in Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe. And when Lord Carrington, who was foreign secretary of, of Britain, after he had been told that Nigeria said she was watching closely what Britain would do, and Britain had to play its role. And Lord Carrington said, Nigeria can only back and not bite, unquote. He said that on BBC, he said, we don't take what Nigeria is taking seriously. 
because Nigeria can only back and cannot bite. That very night, General Lovasundo's government nationalized British petroleum assets. And of course, the Lancaster House talks in England immediately picked Temple, and then they agreed on the liberation of, uh, of, of Zimbabwe, and the white minority rule ended in Zimbabwe. So you can see that all of these foreign policy positions was through kinetic, giving military assistance to the liberation movements and soft power application, like the nationalization of British petroleum and so on and so forth. And the high point of our soft power deployment, I think, was the uh, establishment of the Technical Aid Corps, domiciled in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where Nigeria determined that Africa was the centerpiece of our foreign policy. And wherever the black man or black woman is anywhere in the world, including the Caribbeans, Nigeria will make sure they are supported. So we began to send skilled manpower to different African countries and to the Caribbeans under the Technical Aid Corps to assist other African countries who didn't have as much skilled manpower as Nigeria had. So we applied both soft power and kinetic, if you like, uh, the, the kinetic uh, um, deployment you know, of, of, uh, of power to, to achieve our foreign policy objectives. So I think we've been consistent. Uh, and I think, like I said, it was only when Soviet Union, the Soviet Union collapsed, and that had impact on every country, not just Nigeria. And up till today, even the European countries and the Americans are still trying to recalibrate their foreign policy, just like us. Uh, let's talk about Nepal, you know, uh, as a critical turning point. Uh, it's the new partnership for Africa's development. Uh, do you do you see or do you think that there is still an, uh, a political will, you know, directed towards that, uh, you know, formation? Because it seems like there has been a, a, a lot of display of selfishness on the level of, you know, uh, each nation, each African country fighting for themselves you know at an individual level and you can you, you can see that from you know what is going on in south sudan and in sudan generally people are fighting their wars and the entire africa is keeping quiet even nigeria as the big brother that we claim to be uh even though we have our troops over there but little or no conversations go on about these issues Meanwhile, we have Nepal, and it is still, you know, supposed to be functional. Do you see a political will to step back to the beginning of, of you know, for the reason for the formation of this organization in, in the first place, and to bring Africa together, if not as a United States of Africa, uh, which might be nice if it ever happens, but at least as the, the brotherhood that we've always shared, that we've always had. I mean, the, the, the African tradition is such that you know, you are your brother's keeper. If your neighbor is wailing, you are wailing along with him and you're mourning along with him. What do you, how do you react to that? Thank you very much, Uche. And that's a very, very brilliant question. Um, you know, the African Union aims to have a United States of Africa, just like you said. Uh, but the way to get there, the road to get there is to, to develop the different sub-regions. And that's why, where the, uh, the uh, roadmap is essentially woven around the, de the development of the various sub-regions through the regional economic communities, the RECs. So in West Africa, we have ECOWAS. Southern Africa, we have SADC. In, in, in East Africa, we have the East African Community. And in Central Africa, we have the Central African Customs Union. Now, if you look at all these regional economic communities, and uh, yesterday we made an allusion to that, the most advanced of those regional economic communities is ECOWAS. <clears throat> and yesterday when we were talking about ECOWAS, we highlighted all the achievements of ECOWAS, including the introduction of free movement. ECOWAS started visa-free movement many, many, many years before even Schengen started in Europe. ECOWAS became the first regional economic community to have a community passport, the ECOWAS passport. And all of this happened, by the way, when Nigeria returned to democracy in 1999. Nigeria was able to mobilize and, and galvanize the rest of, of West Africa. But if you look, if comparatively, if you look at SADE, sorry, ECOWAS also became the first sub-regional body in the world to deploy a Pacific uh, instrument for the resolution of conflict. That was ECOMOG. 
And ICOMOG became the first military Pacific instrument in the world to carry out peace enforcement, what the United Nations calls Chapter 7 operations. Even the UN had not undertaken Chapter 7 operations when ECOMOG switched from white helmet operations to green helmet operations in Liberia. So these are some of the monumental achievements of, of, of ECOWAS, which are underplayed even by Africans themselves, who do not understand, or some of whom do not understand or appreciate the significant progress that, that this body has made. So if you look like South Sudan that you mentioned, the, the problem in, in that region is because the region is not as um, harmonious as the West African sub-region, you know. And when today we, you can you can you can count several Pacific instruments that ECOWAS alone has deployed. You had ECOMOG one in Liberia. You had ECOMOG two in Sierra Leone. You had uh, ECOMISI, that is ECOWAS mission in Cote d'Ivoire. You had ECOMOG in Benin Bissau. You had ECOMIC, ECOWAS mission in Gambia, which is the most recent. So if you, if you count almost six different Pacific instruments, whereas Southern African countries, for example, are now only able to deploy their first Pacific instrument into Mozambique. You know, so if the, the problem in East Africa or Horn of Africa is largely because, in my view, and I say this uh, respectfully, not, um, not that I'm disdaining the other sub-regions, it's just because I think those sub-regions have not developed their regional economic community to the level to which the West Africans have. And that's what the African Union has agreed should be the, the, uh, the, the if you like, the plants on which the emerging United States of Africa should hinge. Now, if we come to NEPA, which was your, your, your question proper, um, I agree with you. I think it has lost steam, okay? Uh, most of the achievements of NEPA, if you even look at, for example, uh, when NEPAD was launched and was being vigorously pursued, every African country was under obligation to set up a ministry of integration and cooperation in Africa. And all African countries went ahead to set up their ministries of integration and, and uh, cooperation. Because why? We were more or less trading and collaborating with our former colonial, you know, powers, called colonial masters, rather than with ourselves. And one of the achievements of the new partnership for African development was to ensure that we as Africans can trade with ourselves, can visit ourselves, can build on the bonds, the fraternal bonds, the cultural bonds, the ethnic bonds that already exist, you know, in pre-colonial times. And um, the fire seems to have gone down. But one good thing is that and maybe this will give you comfort, Uche, because you asked the question. Mm -hmm. One good thing is that the African continental free trade area, which is now, which even President Buhari uh, had to sign Nigeria's, you know, the, 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 the accept, you know, he had to sign the treaty and he had to go to parliament for ratification. That African continental free trade area is a byproduct of NEPA. Mm -hmm. So even if NEPA isn't as you know, vigorous or vibrant that you can see today, the fruits of Nepal are still hanging around. But I agree with you that our leaders today need to vigorously, uh, you know, embrace those aspects of Nepal that we need to forcefully or, pro or radically implement. And just permit me to quickly add that President Julio Sinyeri, the first president of Tanzania, there was something he often said. And as a young person, when I heard him, I really never understood that statement until I, many, many years later, I had the opportunity of being posted to East Africa and I could actually visit Tanzania, you know, on missions. And I now appreciated, and then visiting other African countries, I now seriously appreciated what President Inyeriri was saying. President Inyeriri was making a very good point. He said, listen, all African countries are not equally endowed. So if, for example, we all as, uh, agree, for example, that we all need to, we need to build cars. There is, no, let me use power generation. Let me not use cars. We all need electricity in Africa, okay? Some countries are endowed with hydro electrical, electricity potentials. They have big rivers and so on. Some don't have. And if you look at the, the quarrel between Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt today, because Ethiopia built a dam 
on the Blue Nile. I'm sure you're following that argument. Yeah. So you can just imagine what Yiri was saying. He said, listen, every country doesn't have to build a hydroelectric station. Let the country that is better endowed, let that country go ahead and build it. Okay? And then let an agreement be made so that countries that don't have such resources can benefit from the electricity that will come from there. And they can get it at a reasonable cost and so on and so forth. In other words, let us cite projects and let projects be community owned or let projects be regionally owned. There's no reason for, for Ghana to set up a vehicle plant and then Togo sets up a vehicle plant and then Bene sets up a vehicle plant. Maybe Ghana and Nigeria can have vehicle plants and we all sell, and then maybe Cote d'Ivoire as well, and we sell to the rest of, our, of, of West Africa. Yeah. So this is the spirit of Nepal, which when President Yerere was saying that, we were not even thinking of Nepal. Mm. But then Nepal has come. But like I said, the next president of Nigeria, yeah. and that's one of the things one would expect, will need to do a lot to actually ensure that this, the letter and spirit of Nepal is brought back alive. Okay, because that was our next question to you just wrap it up here on this segment. Uh, just asking you, what are these critical things that the next government should do, the next president particularly, uh, will have to do to strengthen our relationship with other African countries? Uh, mm -hmm. Before we talk about the, the globe, but African countries okay. for today. Just briefly before okay. we take the next Yes, question. sure, sure. Number one, uh, let's talk specifically to Nigeria, our... our what you call instruments of foreign policy. The instruments of foreign policy is the president of Nigeria, the minister of foreign affairs, the minister of foreign affairs and our diplomats, okay? And then our military and our economic resources and so on and so forth. Number one, um, I think that um, President Buhari has launched, he's been practicing, although they, he's not calling it what I, what I would call it now, but that's what he's been trying to do. Citizen diplomacy, that wherever Nigerian citizens are, he will make sure they do not suffer. And uh, when I was in India, for instance, the president came to India, and I know he insisted he wanted to talk to all Nigerians there. And I see him doing this in every country he goes to. And going further than that, to give concrete expression to it, he set up the Diaspora Commission. And I'm sure everybody knows about the Diaspora Commission with uh, Honorable Abike Dabiri as a yeah, chair yeah. person. And I think this is a very nice move, especially because the Nigerian diaspora sends not less than $20 billion to Nigeria every year. But I believe that the next president of Nigeria should make sure that there is clarity in what the Diaspora Commission is doing and in what our Minister of Foreign Affairs is doing. I won't go into details because we don't have time. But I feel that there is some overlapping, and we must never diminish our Minister of Foreign Affairs. It, this, this is where I have the diplomats. Uh, secondly, I've spoken about Nepal. So I would say that, um, thirdly, the, pre the next president has to make sure that Nigeria is well situated in the emerging international uh, uh, space that we're seeing. Because after the Ukraine-Russian conflict will have ended, or even before the Ukraine-Russian conflict ends, there is already a new international power structure that is emerging. And in my view, this past structure is going to be the United States and NATO on the one hand, the Russia on the other hand, and China. So Nigeria must make sure that we are not, we do not take sides with any of these three. We must maintain our neutrality in a way that guarantees our own interest. You know, I, I feel strongly that we should not align with any of these three. So if you like, maybe the non-alignment of the 70s will be coming back. Because we are going to end up in an arms race, and we are going to end up in a trilateral international global system. So I feel that the Nigerian president has to work hard to make sure that we remain neutral and can take the advantages and benefits of that neutrality. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Bayo. Um, if, if you think of something else, that might come a, a little bit later. But for now, we'll just take a break. And when we return, we'll be talking about building collapse in uh, Lagos State and what the next government should do to make sure that these things, if not totally eradicated, uh, reduced the incidences of buildings collapsing almost on a monthly basis in Lagos State. In a populated uh, environment like ours, we should never have 
incidents like that. If it is avoidable, let's know how to avoid it. We'll be joined by Mr. Uh, Friday Chuku, who is an engineer in that sector, and he will be telling us what are the causes and what can be done about that. Stay with us. <laughs> 